Hi, everybody. Rick DiClemente with Astrology Unplugged. Welcome to the show tonight. I believe we're on show 281, 281, which makes me think, who am I going to have as a guest on 300? But I just don't know. i got some big ideas. Anyhow, welcome aboard. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the United States chart because we refer to it now and then tonight i want to delve into it and show you what's happening actually this was uh liza's idea and there are a lot of things that are going on right now some things coming some things you've been warned about for a long time and they're here and we we'll try to give you a different perspective on it when you see things at, at an astrological viewpoint you can you can get a different archetypal understanding of what's going on the underpinnings that are going on and um naomi i hope that whatever we do here can help you australians out here is the chart of the united states um, one second And as we have talked about many times, the chart is the chart is well known. There are some people who believe that the U.S. was not started on the fourth of July. Some people believe it was started on the second of July. Uh, most people did believe it was on the fourth. There are at least seven different charts because nobody thought down thought to write down the time. Nobody thought to write down the time that the country was born. Here comes Sigmund. Hello, Sigmund. Anyhow, there are about seven different charts that astrologers argue about. This is probably one of the most favorite. It's the one with Sagittarius rising. And as you will notice, this chart was rectified by an astrologer named Sibley and one of the great astrologers, Dane Rudger. So it's one of the reasons I use it. Um, another reason I use this chart is because this chart was bombarded during 9-11. That's pretty uh, my good clue. Some other charts are not. So as you look at the chart of the United States, you got to remember, hello, Sigmund. You got to remember that in 1776, there was no Uranus, there was no Neptune, there was no Pluto, there was no Chiron, and there was no Eris. And when they did that, these guys knew astrology. Jefferson was known to be an astrologer, so was um, the great astrologer, which was um, um, well, I can't remember all their names. I'm just getting worse and worse mentally. Um, so anyhow, when they picked when they picked the chart, when they picked the date and time of the chart, watch what happened. Franklin, how could I forget Benjamin Franklin? He was the genius. Okay, this is the chart with all today's planets on it. Okay, but if you go back to 1776 and you go to the list of planets and you take off Eris and the node and Chiron and Pluto and Neptune and Uranus, you're left with the most outer body planet, which was named Saturn. Boom, there was the chart at the time. And the farthest planet that you could see, even with a telescope, was Saturn. Saturn is, has always been known as the main planet in astrology. And as you can see in this chart, Saturn is up in the 10th house where it's ruled, where it rules. It's exalted in the sign of Libra. This is a guarantee of being a, a pronounced major state of the world. Okay, then what do you do? You put the sun, I'm not sure why they put the sun in Cancer. I think 
the reason they did was we were largely agricultural. Cancer is a great sign for agriculture, growing things. It's, a, it's known for its richness. It's known for a family atmosphere. Um, it's known for being, being very tough, defending itself. A lot of reasons. A lot of reasons you want to not have a cancer country, too, which I can tell you all about that. But they put the sun next to Jupiter, next to Venus, not far from Mars. The early planets of the zodiac, sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars. Four out of the five personal planets, four planets plus the moon, those are the five personal planets. They put one, two, three, four personal planets. One, two, three, four personal planets in this chart. When you are born with a sun next to Jupiter, eight degrees away, and Jupiter two degrees away from Venus, this is a rich, rich country. Riches, 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 rich soil, rich money, rich people, rich resources. A very resourceful country. Now, if this, in fact, is the correct chart that was born and rectified for 514 in the afternoon in Philadelphia, why did they choose to put the sun in the seventh house, along with Jupiter, Venus, and Mars? Well, the seventh house has a lot to do with, a tremendous amount to do with your relationship to the world. So this shows us as being a big play, player in the world, major involvement in the world, major good luck. You know, back in those days, they saw Jupiter as really the good luck planet and Saturn as the bad luck planet. And even today, those old fashioned ideas still unfortunately remain. But an awful lot of good things in this chart. Put Mercury in the eighth house in Cancer. That's a deep researching type of mind to the people. But this is a very friendly nation. Very friendly, shaking hands, working interplay with other countries. Put Saturn up in the 10th house. We almost automatically become the ruling nation of the world, which we have been since. Saturn, people are going to look to us to be the model. And Saturn is in Libra. What is rising? And this is questionable why you would want Sag rising. A lot of people think Sag is the end all be all. It's not. But Sag rising makes us a fun, uh, festive, forward looking, educated country. A lot of reasons to look for Sag rising. Then you see everything is a bucket pattern to the moon, and you would say another bucket pattern to Saturn. So this isn't intriguing. And why would they pick moon in Aquarius? Very intriguing. If you've ever studied people with moon in Aquarius, such as Marcia and her brother, who have moon in Aquarius, they're a little bit aloof. They're friendly. They're really, they they're really the definition of friendly, which is really, really chummy and friendly. And the moon in Aquarius, people have thoughts about other countries, other people matter to you. Whereas the cancer, the cancer, 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 cancer it is more of a closed off provincial type of country. So the moon in Aquarius really helps us to reach out to other countries to help other ones and interplay with them. Having Sagittarius rising, the ruler of Sagittarius is Jupiter. So Jupiter, which is exalted in Cancer, is the ruler of the chart. The planet that rules the rising sign, the planet that rules the rising sign rules the whole chart. So the whole chart is ruled by Jupiter. Again, this is no accident. I'd be just thinking that no matter what the cat does, the cat's always going to land on its four feet. That's what Sag rising is about. That's what Sagittarius 
energy is about. It's a lucky energy. It's almost always fortunate and it always lands on its feet. Serendipitous. So along came a few years later, just a few years later, and his new planet was discovered called Uranus. And each time we add a new planet, you see the whole country changes. It was just a few years later, really. The whole country changes and the, the new psyche of the people become ready to absorb that new energy. When a planet is accepted and visualized and seen and categorized, that means that the collective mind is now ready for that energy. Same thing happened in 1930 with Pluto, 1860, whatever, with Neptune. We'll go on with, with those later. So we look at this chart. It's the late 1770s. And we take a look at this chart. And we go and we find this new planet called Uranus and put it on the chart. And where does it end up? Right here. Surprise, surprise. Now remember, this, this was not known during the time when the country started. These are additions. Uranus brought about the age, the mechanical rev industrial revolution. This is what started it. Now, when Uranus was added to our chart, it was added to everybody's chart in the world. So you saw the massive industrial revolution that came from it. Now, what we didn't realize is that it would be in the sign of Gemini, which has its pluses and minuses, and it's really close to the descendant. Five degrees away, six degrees away. So when Uranus became a big deal, Uranus in Gemini became the symbol of this is the place of life. This is the place of the, the new land. Go and squat and pick up some new land. It's all sitting there free and easy. Go on and take yourself some land in the new land. Can you imagine from the old historical movies that you've seen of Europe and how it was dark and dingy and full of plagues? And there is USA. Go across this body of water, there it is. Sparkling with new possibility. When you add Uranus to a chart, it's a big deal. It's a big, powerful, major planet. It's on the angle. It's opposite the ascendant. Now what happens? Opposite the ascendant. The ascendant, the descendant. That has everything to do with how we are to be in all of our relationships with every other country, with every person within the country. So surprise, surprise, here comes Uranus. And Uranus gives us this tremendous, tremendous desire, like Aquarius, this tremendous desire to be free, the land of the free. It's in Gemini, the land of exploring initiatives and exploring all the, the possibilities of high tech and tech solutions to everything, still is to this day. But what it doesn't give you, and what we've been trying to struggle with and work through, it's a planet that doesn't want to be tied down. It's a planet that is aloof. It's a planet that's very unpredictable. It's a planet that just cannot stand being tied down or bossed around. Okay, it's not too bad, but we can see some trouble really stirring with Uranus. Now, there's definitely trouble stirring with it. Now, let's take a look here. We see the Uranus is not making many aspects. It is trying to Saturn at 14 and at eight. That's a rather good trying, really, because this is conservatism. This is unorthodox. This is orthodox. Shows that these two major forces in the country blend well together. They're trying together when it's time to tighten the belt, when it's time to spend the money. 
when it's time to be forward thinking, when it's time to respect the past. So these things work out pretty well. And this is a very funny part of the chart here. I've been studying this for the last several years real strongly. This late sixth house, the late sixth house coming into the seventh house is a real funny, peculiar, touchy, powerful, surprising area. When planets come through here, even today in your chart, the sixth house is work. It's your health. It's your attitude towards serving people. Towards It's really, when planets come through here, it's almost always learning a new job skill set. Almost always. A few things in astrology are almost always. This is one of them. When planets come through here, you start to learn new job skill sets. When Uranus comes through here, you start to learn them on the computer, online, scientific. But why? And the reason why is because it knows it's about to cross this line. And as we've seen in the exquisite zodiac, these four angles, the ascendant, the descendant, I'm sorry, the ascendant, the descendant, the mid heaven and the nadir. When these lines are crossed, they're very major occurrences because the planet is activating that next quadrant. The whole quadrant comes to life. The whole quadrant comes to life. When Uranus pokes its head over that line, this whole quadrant comes to life. The quadrant of relationships. This is all covered in this book. So when Uranus is approaching this line, it's if this were today's reading and our reading with this client, and this client had this chart, I would say, you're about to adopt a new role in society, a new role with the public. And with Uranus coming into the seventh, it's one of being a leader of technology, being a leader of helping people find their freedom, putting up a plaque on the side of the Statue of Liberty that talks about send us your troubled and your weak and your you're old and you're sick, and we all have a, 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 a home here. We saw how that lasted. Still lasts to a great degree, but it has its troubles now. But we look at, have we not been the home of immigration? And tons and tons of people, the melting pot, people coming from all over the world. So when you're in a scud here, it made the chart more nervous. It made the chart more high strung. And probably after 1777, seven or whatever it was, you started to see the tension that was going on with England, France, and the United States, and the tension between the three and other countries and the advanced politics that were necessary to play in this field. We're just getting started. Next planet came along 1860-something, I forget. Neptune. Neptune comes along. Neptune is the planet of spirit. This is when spirituality took place. This is when seances started happening. Neptune also rules gases and chemicals, and you saw revolutionary things happening in our laboratories with Neptune gases, et cetera. But you saw a great spirituality start to change. And this is very significant because Neptune is in Virgo. And Neptune is kind of weird in Virgo because Neptune is the natural ruler of the planet opposite, the sign opposite, Pisces. And Neptune is the opposite of what Virgo is. In astrology, Virgo and Neptune are very much opposites. This is a very strange home for Neptune. Neptune being all-inclusive and very mystical and very dreamy and godlike, and Virgo being down to earth, nail it down, uh, get organized, be perfect, 
Neptune. Don't worry about perfection. There is no such thing. So when Neptune came into the ninth house, the ninth house is your philosophy. Do not underrate your ninth house in your chart. Okay? When Neptune goes into your ninth house, when any planet goes into your ninth house, you will start to notice your philosophy starting to change. You will start to take different subjects in college. It's higher education at ninth house. Third house is smaller education, early education. Ninth house, Neptune. So what we saw was sea going efforts, Neptune ruling the sea. We saw the mind expanding. We saw uh, radioactivity being discovered. I mean, lots and lots of dramatic changes when a major planet is found. I believe his name was Herschel discovered Uranus. I can't remember the founder of Neptune. So another thing that Neptune did, the ninth house is the house of religion. And Neptune came in to the house and Neptune is very much, in my opinion, the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it's in the sign of Virgo, which is do it how you're supposed to do it. And Neptune doesn't know what supposed to means. Neptune doesn't have any rules. Neptune is Pisces. Open the ocean, open your arms, spread your arms, invite everybody, inclusive. But nevertheless, we started to see radical changes throughout the country, religiously, philosophically, spiritually. What aspects do we see? Very important if there are any aspects formed. We look and we see Neptune is square to Mars. Now, I don't know about you, it's got a little tiny sextile to Mercury, and this, this helps us have uh, kind of intuition, et cetera. But I don't know about you, but I did not take this seriously till a couple years ago. And when I saw Neptune square to Mars, I about had a fit. This is a really, really bad aspect. This is one of the problems with the United States. This is what causes us to live in dreamland. This is what causes the rest of the world to think we're all like Dallas or we're all like Hollywood. They don't understand the reality of our country. And when Neptune combines with Mars, it's very troublesome because Mars is what you think you can do. And Neptune thinks you can do anything you want to. So we think we can do anything we want to. And that's oftentimes the mood and the mindset of Americans. This is the, one of the biggest, matter of fact, it is the biggest problem in the USA's chart, is this Neptune square to Mars. There's no mindset of maybe we should have some boundaries to what we do. Maybe we should think about them anyway. No, with Neptune, oh, just do what you want. And the Mars is in Gemini. Isn't that right? Yeah, the Mars is in Gemini. So, so we think on the thinking level that we can think about anything we want to. We got tremendous imagination artistically, etc. But the problem comes in when the Mars is seated in the seventh house of relationships. This is a seventh house Mars. Planets closer to the cusp. In other words, a planet on this side of the seventh house is much stronger than a planet in the middle or a planet near the end. The seventh house is this area. A planet on this end is much stronger. So the Mars is really strong in this part of the chart. Mars and Gemini, is about being a jack of all trades, able to do all these different kinds of things. But when Neptune is square to your Mars, it naturally, naturally makes everybody not trust us. It's what it does. I know you have to something. 
They got another agenda. What's going on here? On the other hand, it does bring about a very spirit. Look at that cat. It does bring about a spiritual wanting to help other countries and being very generous and very, very open and, and giving them wheat and trying to spread the gospel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Neptune Square and Mars is a very, very dangerous proposition. Look what happened in the last 10 years. You tell me this ain't a country with Neptune Square and Mars. You tell, tell me this is not a country that's gone off in chase of La La Land past 10 years. Look what's happened. La La Land. We can do anything we want. Push the reset button. Oh, it closed up. Push the reset button. Pretty troubling. I think it's a very, very negative aspect. And I'm sure there are other good things about it, but what the country needs because of it is to be more sober, to be more realistic, to be more realistic about what our limitations are. The seventh house is so critical, and I have been screaming so loud for the last 20 years about the seventh house. Why? Here's why. You've heard me on the six years of this show. In the last, in the last six years, Pluto has been, we'll, we'll get to Pluto later, but Pluto has been opposite the sun. Pluto has been opposite the sun. And whenever you have Pluto opposite the sun, you we've gone through this several years ago. We went through a big time identity crisis, which still is going on. But when an opposition is involved, it's always got a seventh house connotation to it. Oppositions are seventh house like. If the sun is here and that's our sun and, and uh, Pluto's over here, that comes from the seventh house. What's that mean? Pluto with the word betrayal, Pluto's main word, the main word it's upset about, the main thing it's always concerned about is betrayal. Pluto has been trying to influence us in the last 10, 20 years to start playing straight with our friends. Being straight, being a level playing field with, with open enemies. The seventh house, are enemies that you know you have. The 12th house are enemies you have, you don't know who they are. So I kept telling everybody, with the enemies that we know we have, like China and Russia and um, Korea, etc., we had better clean up the deck on how we're going to play with these people. Or I told you over and over, they're not going to want to play with us. And look what's happened. Okay, this is part of the reason. Part of it is NATO with the Neptune problem. Part of it is what Pluto has been doing to the sun. Now, you can see why people in other countries are dying to get here. We got all these resources. Everything's quick and it's fresh and it's broad. And we got these great big buffers of Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean on both sides and two really pretty friendly countries. Canada, Mexico on the top and bottom. We're not squished between Germany and Austria and Russia. I mean, it's a real big difference. Okay, you can see why people want that. But what we're seeing, and I think we're seeing it for a lot of reasons that I'm going to get into in a minute. We're seeing a lot of disillusionment with the United States by other countries and by ourselves. True or false? True or false? People are disillusioned with us. Okay, that's okay if we learn from it, turn it around. But it's not easy when you don't have advanced planets. When you have all early planets, it's tough to turn things around. Okay? Early planets just don't have the capacity later planets do, such as Aquarius, Capricorn, 
Pisces, etc. So let's go back to the chart. This story is going to just keep changing. Now, we get into 1930. We put this new planet in 1930. Herschel, I forget his name too. The planet Pluto is discovered. What do we get with Pluto? Pluto is here. Pluto is opposite Mercury. Pluto is ruler of Scorpio. What do we get? We get atomic weapons and we get Adolf Hitler. Okay, that's two pretty big stories with Pluto right away. And for Pluto was exactly in 1930s, exactly when Hitler, Hitler was gaining power. Okay, so we start to see the dangers of atomic weapons. We start to see the danger of uh, tyrants. We start to see uh, the question of, are we using or abusing our energies uh, properly or not? So we start to see that, boy, these wars are a dangerous things. We do come close to blowing everything up when Pluto's around. So when Pluto came out, Another thing came out was really intriguing a few years later, and I think it's a really big deal, was this TV show called Twilight Zone. Because all of a sudden, everybody started becoming scared of boogeyman, scared of what's under the bed, scared of the unconscious. Freud comes out. Jung comes out. That's what Pluto does. It's the ruler of the unconscious mind. So, it's a marvelous thing to master, and it's a hell of a planet to be a slave to. So we got 1930 now. Now, the first thing that happens is it appears in the second house of money. When was the Depression? 1929, 1930. This is why, because Pluto popped its head out into existence in the second house. Almost dragged us under. Pluto was found at 27, opposite Mercury at 24. I don't like things too close. This ain't bad, three degrees. But what this means, three degrees, what it means in a chart is that the Mercury entity feels inferior mentally. I'm not sure about how this plays, but it's probably, probably in the 30s, I would think, that we scholastically probably tried to come up, raise the bar, and compete with the other minds in Europe and other countries. I would, I would imagine there's a theme of that. But now you've got a completely different chart. You got Pluto opposite Mercury. You got Uranus in Gemini. You got Uranus in Gemini. I'm sorry, you got Mars in Gemini square to Neptune, la la land, you got a whole different chart now. Whole different chart, let's continue. It's an amazing chart now. And we do have a lot of what? Good luck. We just end up landing on our feet. That may be well enough to just solve this nation's problems forever, I don't know. Look what it does in Trump's chart. He still gets away with whatever, because it's Jupiter. Jupiter just makes you get away with the M word. Next planet we want to look at. We definitely want to look at, um, even though I'm not an expert on it, we want to look at the North Node. We want to look at Eris. We want to look at Chiron. This is everybody now. There's your full chart. There's the full chart. So I don't know a lot about the node, so I don't speak much about it. Here comes Chiron in 1977, Marsha Bud. 1977. Think about it. 1977. 
Here is the planet. It's an asteroid. It's actually not an asteroid. It's called a it's called a centaur, and it's out between Saturn and, and Uranus. It's not between Mars and Saturn. It's on the next groove over. And Chiron is the the sim, symbolic of two two major things. Chiron is the um, wounded healer. So Chiron has a lot to do with healing and wounds. In, in, in mythology, Chiron had a, uh, an arrow shot into its heel, its Achilles heel, and it was permanent. It had to suffer with this forever until one day it couldn't stand it anymore. And Chiron begged Zeus to let him become a mortal and let him die. And Zeus agreed with him as long as he would take his position up in the sky, which he did. So he has a lot to do with your wound. And in age 51, Chiron comes back around the zodiac. So Chiron goes around the earth every 51 years. It has a very elliptical orbit. So you can't really look at patterns when it's squaring and opposite, but you can look at Chiron at age 51. And this is why so many people look at your life age 51. Your Chiron in this particular Chiron of the country means that we have a weak spot in getting noted for who we are. Chiron and Aries people, the, the weak spot is not being noticed. Chiron and Capricorn, you're, you're not noticed for your social uh, successes, etc. So when Chiron returns 51 years later, usually that wound gets worse or better. So look at your own life, your own kids, your own family, Look at the country when you're 51 years of age, it's a big deal. But in 1977, what you started to see was all these schools started coming about. The Gurdjieff schools, the spiritual schools, EST, a primal scream, all these things started to come out of the woodwork. The healers. And when you want to see healing in somebody's chart, you look and see where their Chiron is. It tells you a lot. And that's why in that book, I changed tunes and I did not agree with the continual theme of Virgo being ruled by Mercury. I made an association of Chiron being the ruler of Virgos. Since then, I've become certain that Virgo is ruled, co-ruled by Mercury along with Gemini, but it's also ruled by Chiron. And I don't know, but I think what's happened to me in my mindset is I think the whole concept of rulership needs to be rethought. So we saw tremendous advancement in medicine. We saw tremendous advancement with healing, the healing arts. Now it's just gone nuts. Thank God. Look at how many, how many people, look at how many people got their shingle out and their healers of different notoriety. Some are good, some are wannabes. But we've discovered so many alternative types of medicine. Now, In 1952 through 1989, Chiron was opposite this planet. These two planets were opposite each other. For 37 years, from 1952 to 1989, Chiron was opposite. Uranus. That's a major planet, Uranus. So is Chiron. Translation, magical new age, off the wall, out of nowhere, medical healing, alternative healing. So all these people born between 1952 and 1989 have this opposition in their chart. 
And it just so happened that the way these two planets rotated, they just stayed in opposition to themselves for 37 years, for the most part. That's why people like in this group, you'll see um, Claudia. One second. Claudia in this group. Do you have a two, Susan? Okay. A lot, a lot of you probably have it. But Claudia's got it right across the ascendant. And when it's right across the ascendant, that is the symbol of an astrologer. People with Chiron opposite Uranus are people that just have a knack for astrology. They understand these levels of thinking. They understand these levels of archetypal concepts. Okay, so a lot of things came out when Chiron came out. The other thing that came out with Chiron is its other side. This is the side I work with more. Most of the time when you talk to an astrologer, they talk about the wound and the wound being healed. When I work with Chiron, I work an awful lot with your life direction, your passion, what are you meant to do? And it seems to follow suit. And that's why I have another reason I've assigned Chiron to the rulership of Virgo. When Virgos come to see you, they want to know one thing. They want to know if they're on the right track. Am I on the right track? Because I want to keep the goddess happy. It's not the gods. It's the goddess happy. Virgos flip out if they're off track. But if they're on track, they're happy as beaches. Okay? So when I look at Chiron, I'm, I'm more obsessed with the life direction, which I think you can start to see in 1977. You heard more about vision quests at that time. People went on vision quests, different mystical journeys to try to fine tune their, um, their, their, their life life purpose. Now, the other planet that came along was Eris. Okay. So, in 2005, she was discovered. She's still not being looked at. I just did a talk, uh, a major talk with a, a major group of people, and there are all these astrologers in there, and, and none of them are following Eris, except me. And it looks to me like about 95% of astrologers, 90% are not following Eris. She was discovered in 05 and 06. When she was discovered, 80 other planets were discovered. So we had the choice to add 80 new planets up beyond Pluto, slow moving. We had a choice of adding 80 new planets to that circle or removing two of them. And that's how Pluto got demoted. Pluto and Ceres, for technical reasons, they made them non-planets. Well, you can make them non-planets if you're an astronomer, but you can't make them a non-planet if you're an astrologer, because Pluto is an astrologer. It's astrological reality. Thank you very much. You don't tell Pluto that it's a non-planet. Okay. So when Eris was discovered, this guy named um, Legris, Chiron Legris, Chiron Legris, wrote this fabulous book 12 years later, which would have been um, 2017, wrote this fabulous book called Discovering Eris. And man, is this book good. The first half is very mythological. The second half is all about the astrological implications. I think Marsh is going to go get it right now. Okay, Discovering Eris. It will not hurt you to buy this book. It's excellent. The first half explains her mythological nature. There she is, Discovering Eris by Chiron LeGrice. She's on... Uh, She's on Amazon like the whole world is. And Chiron LeGrice is a follower of the great Richard Tarnas. 
apparently she's the brother, Eris is the sister of Mars. She's a wild thing. She's the goddess of discord and craziness. And she's ruling things right now. If you think this is an, an Erisian time period, you're crazy. Okay, so she's been with us in 05 and 06, which is exactly when Trump came on the scene. Okay, now what does she do? She does a couple of things. She's, she was a goddess and she was not invited to a party of goddesses and gods and she got really mad. So what did she do in mythology? She created this golden apple and she engra engraved on the golden apple, who is the fairest of all of you? And she threw it through the window and she invaded the, invaded the party. She crashed the party with this apple and caused all this chaos among all the females arguing about who is the fairest. So there she is creating chaos. I'm not up on what happened to her after that. That would be in that book. Um, she does not care what she has to do if she has to use major amounts of chaos to get what she wants. She's not like Pluto. Pluto's destruction, but even Pluto's got its limits. Not Eris. Pluto doesn't care about Eris doesn't care about limits. Eris is about whatever's wrong. We're going to fix it. You've been treated unfairly. We're going to fix it. You've been discounted. We're going to fix it. We got to use weapons. We got to use destructive forces. Okay, we'll do it. That's what Eris is. So when Eris came about in 05 and 06, what you gradually started to see was this idiotic mentality that so many wanted, so many people were walking around with now with this mentality of I can do anything I want to. It doesn't matter because I'm doing this because I'm not being treated fairly. Wahoo. Now, if you tell me that doesn't explain the last 10, 15 years, then I will hand in my astrologer card. Because so many of us have picked up the wrong side of Eris, the negative side. They've identified with Trump the whiner. I'm not treated fairly. Well, you deserve to get it because of that. I'm not treated fairly. I'm getting screwed. Look how I get screwed by them. They're screwing me. Look at it, all the unfair treatment. And look at all the misnomers. And look at all of the incorrect accusations. When that's not what Eris is really about. It's her fault because she speaks so wildly that she gets what she gets. But the other side of Eris is the wonderful side, which is We've got to repair the unfairness. We've got to bring about the uncounted and count them. We've got to bring about justice to the people who've been treated unjustly, but we need to do it in a sane way. Well, now you've got the two worlds that are verging on civil war. This is why. Now, spin forward. In the last several years, and remember, Eris moves very slowly. Matter of fact, she moves very fast. It's just she's so, she's so far away, it looks like she's moving slowly. She's moving through the zodiac slowly. She's been in, um, let's, let's do the chart for now. This is the chart for right now, this minute. The, Eris entered the sign of Aries, she entered Aries in 1920. This is one reason you had such a phenomenal outburst of creative changes in Paris and in New York City in 1920 artistically. This is why it was because of Aries's influence. So she entered a new zodiac, not just a new sign, 540 years going around, 
she enters Aries, 1920, in right about the time of World War I. She's been in Aries since then. All of us and everybody you know, born since 1920, 1921, have Aries in the sign of Aries. Right now, this is where she is at 24. She's going to spend another 20 years going back and forth in the sign of Aries, and then she will go into the sign of Taurus. And we'll see an absolute revolution then, too, that is a Taurian revolution. Now, while she's been going back and forth around 24 degrees, what has Pluto been doing? Pluto has been 23, 22, 24, 28, 27, 26, 25. It's gone to 28, and it's, it's backed up now to 26. So we got Pluto squaring Eris. This, my friends, Pluto at a right angle to Eris is what's been causing all this stuff. All this stuff. You've got the massive craziness of Eris square to tremendously volatile Pluto, the two together. And for the first time, I couldn't believe it, three, four weeks ago, when Ksenia Moore was on this show, the Australian who influenced Naomi, she said, you're right. That's what's going on with the world. It is Pluto squaring Eris. Now, think about it. Astrologers are very hesitant to add a new planet. When you add a new planet, it's got to make a lot of sense. You don't add it out there in the mixture there, but all the other crazies. So you look up all the words and I've given them to you, all the key words of Eris. And you ask yourself, have I seen those words applied or happening in our society? Yes. All the craziness and the kids thrown in, the little kids being separated from their parents and being thrown in, in, in prisons, little holding cells. The craziness that's going on with communication. So what Eris is really about, and this is why some people, I think they're wrong, some people want to associate her as ruler of Libra. And I just don't think it's right for many reasons. Apparently, Eris is very upset when communication doesn't take place fairly. And she'll do any damn thing to blow up everybody involved to fix it. This is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons for tonight's talk is so that you will see in the past 20 years, in the past 17 years, how we have all picked up on Eris in our subconscious. The collective has picked it up, but we haven't labeled it right. We think it's this, we think it's that. And a lot of us are picking up the negative side of Eris. We're not picking up the correct side of her, which is to do things in a civil manner. So now we come down to the last 10, 17 years and look at what Eris and Pluto have been doing. This is why I used to write articles and I'd be nervous about talking about the end of the world because people would get on me. Quit being a naysayer, and be careful with your words, and don't be so negative. Blah, 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 blah. Now, you hear it everywhere. People realize that climate problems are really serious, and things are really bad in a lot of ways, and things are very serious that we need to turn around. Okay, then, then in the last couple of years, Eris and Pluto have started to separate. Now, they're coming back together again. They're going to go back and forth like this. And as that angle gets exact, things get more dire. As it starts to separate, things start to get easier. So we look in the chart and we see that Pluto's at 26, 
and Eris is at 25. So it's one degree away. So they're going to get close. Things are going to get intense. Then they're going to separate. Then eventually, Pluto will make its merry way much faster than Eris, because Eris is so slow moving. Okay. Next thing. You've heard a lot about this. Look what, look. In the, in the, in the United States chart, Pluto's at 27 and a half. 243, 246 years later, Pluto's gone all the way around all this time that the United States has existed. Different things happen when Pluto hit different things. In this past February, Pluto got to 2733. Pluto returned. Okay. Now, in the next couple of years, Pluto is going to go past that point, stop and go back. It's going to go over three times. And eventually, it'll start to weaken in about three or four years. It'll start to weaken and move on. But what's going on during a Pluto return? Well, you've heard of Saturn returns. When a planet returns to where the point where it started, the bills become due. The nature of the planet archetypally, don't give me that look. <laughs> look at that green eye on her. She give me that green eye look. Oh man, is she something? I think she's Plutonian. and she doesn't want to hear about Pluto. I think she is. She always give me that little look. <laughs> okay, when Pluto returns, Pluto as an archetype, these energies are inside of our nature. As an archetype, it comes out and it says, we've got to look at how well we've been using Pluto for 240 years. Have we been using our power? Have we been abusing our power? This is why so many of these questions have come about since February, because Pluto has returned. On the negative side, Pluto gets very angry, and it wants to make restitution with people like the Indians that we've screwed, or whomever that we've screwed, the women that we've screwed, whatever they want to make restitution. On the good side, Pluto wants you to realize, and this is really powerful. This is really, really important that you understand this. When Pluto returns, your power arrives. Ain't no two ways about it. Our power is getting here. We're becoming more powerful every day. We're taking less excuses every day. We're seeing new programs happen all the time that happen uh, that are being voiced with no more excuses. You know, step up to the plate, find your courage. These are all very Plutonian themes. So at the same time, the good, you got the bad as is always the case. So one of the things that Pluto return has done to us is made the country ask itself, because you do not, you cannot be ass Pluto. You cannot bullshit Pluto or Scorpio. And what Pluto has done is making us see who we really are. Good, bad, and ugly. You can't pay off somebody so that you can stay out of the war. You can't use smoke and mirrors. You cannot be as Pluto. It's too powerful and it's based on purity, divine purity. Pluto could care less what Eris is doing. Pluto's based on divine purity. Now, I watched Pluto. I watched an interview the other day of, of Charles Manson, who was very scorpionic. And of course, he was a very angry man. He was very dangerous. He was a killer and all this. But if you really look inside 
major Scorpio energies. What they're based on is purity. They're based on a purity. And the reason he became like he was, was he was screwed so bad, he was eating out of garbage cans when he was 10 years of age. His mother was a prostitute. He had all kinds of things go wrong. He was so angry, he was going to make everybody pay because everybody betrayed him, which is the main word with Scorpio. So with Pluto, you're going to either become crystal clean satin sheets you're going to get white white as snow sheets you're going to recover and rededicate yourself to your purity or you're going to destroy yourself because that's pluto's other job pluto's other job is okay i'm gonna give you lots of warnings and it has and i've been telling you for years about the warnings and you've seen the warning. The other option Pluto has is to get rid of you. <clears throat> That's its other job. That's the end of the resume. That's the finality. If you're not gonna take, if you're not gonna take care of this earth that I gave you, then we're just gonna get rid of you because the earth sure doesn't need us. That's how Pluto is. That's how it is inside us. That's how it is around us. That's not somebody's opinion. That's how it is. So why in the world, who is the joker? Who is the joker that chose the same time of the United States Pluto return to make Pluto square to Eris? How could that possibly have happened? There's only one way it happens. It doesn't happen because the gods are mad or show us how powerful they are. It only happens because we're capable of handling it. We're quickly getting the lesson that people have been warning us since the 50s. We're going to blow ourselves up. I'm warning you, we're going to blow ourselves up. Now we're getting the power to deal with it. Now, that doesn't mean all of us. And it's always a small percentage that exponentially affects the whole. But that's what's going on in the world now. All of us, I'm sure each of you can feel this too. And your friends, and you're looking around at most of the people you know. People are more powerful now. They're not taking shit. They're just more powerful. And that's one of the big things. They're just not taking fluff. Okay? And I, I've been seeing this with a lot of new age movements. That there's this false new age BS that goes along with being peaceful all the time. And you can't get mad. And you can't raise your voice. And boy, we see how that one's working out. I'm not talking about being maniacal like Harris once. I'm just talking about speaking up, being strong, standing your ground. You're seeing it happen now as Pluto and Harris are joining hands. Things are intense. Now, another good one. We're having fun. Raise your hand if you're having fun. We're having fun tonight. Okay, we're having fun. Thank you, Sigmund. I'm glad you're having fun there. Okay. Here's the next one, the Neptune story. Get out your test tubes because in the last couple of years, Neptune has been at 22. Neptune has gone around in 164 years. It's gone around another 82 years. Neptune has been opposite Neptune. In the th third house of Pisces, opposite the ninth house in Virgo. Neptune's been opposite Neptune. Do not ever underestimate how powerful and potent Neptune is. It's the quiet ruler of Pisces. It's very pastoral. It's very gentle. But it will erase you in a minute just like acid does. 
like you see smoke machines on the stage. They spread the smoke on the stage and the actor disappears. That's how Neptune works. Okay. What happened when Neptune opposed us? Well, first of all, it was just in the past year. It gave us several years warning, probably about 15 years warning. It gave us about 15 years warning as Neptune was approaching exact opposition to Neptune. Well, what did it do? Just like a Pluto return, Neptune tested us spiritually. I always call it, God takes your clothes off and wants to see what you look like naked. What are you really made of? What, what are you really made of? No hiding, no jewelry, nothing, just you. Are you a spiritual being or not? And this is why we have seen so much tremendous uh, tension in the religions, in the spiritual philosophies. Keep in mind here, we just met each other in 1995. We did not even meet each other till the internet came out in 1995. And Pluto went into Sagittarius. And the West met the East. And East met the West. And we met in the Middle East. And we met in New York. And all these things didn't jive. How and how are we going to deal with all this stuff? It's not jiving. It's not working. And all the things that happened. Think about all the things. Think about it. It's very simple. Think about all the things that are wrong. There's enough. And think about how many things are really sane, reasonable solutions that are being implemented. You don't see that many. How many really sane ways are we taking to clean up the oceans, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the reason that Pluto and Eris is doing what it's doing. It's doing it to scare the shit out of us. And I think it has succeeded. So as Neptune is opposite Neptune, one of the things it's doing is questioning all of the validity of our spiritual endeavors. Our, is our Bible right? Is our Quran right? Is our Upanishads right? Have we really been targeting directly what Jesus meant? Did he really mean for us to put money in the tray? Did he really mean for us to help with the cookie, the cookie collection, the cookie, uh, the raffles at the church? Or did he mean to become one with the God, the creator? Like he kept telling us. So. As Neptune opposes Neptune, it goes back and forth. Two things will happen. You either go off into La La Land and follow some guy who had a TV show and became president and into his little La La Land. There was no, the, the election was fixed, honest. Okay? Different kinds of realities. So we either go into La La Land and Neptune's negative side is you don't want to face the truth. You don't want to see what's there. That's all. That's why so many people become alcoholics. So many have affairs common with Neptune. Or are you going to turn it around and face your deficit spiritually and get yourself on track through new types of spirituality, new endeavors and meditation and different different types. I'm not going to favor one or the other. Where you're really trying to clean yourself out and become more Buddhist or become more um, Eastern, or whatever you want to call it, so that you're more in alignment with what your true soul is about. And you see that happening like crazy everywhere. People are joining these kinds of groups and people are coming out and offering leadership in these kinds of groups. And you have your Nook Sanchez's from Australia and you have your 
your wonderful Ksenia Moore with her spiritual type of astrological teaching. And you have what I'm trying to do and what so many of us. So the Neptune, Neptune is going to continue. Here's a summation. The Neptune, Neptune is going to continue. We're going to either get lo more lost, more unreal, buying the smoke and mirrors, or we're going to start getting in line, starting to throw the old copies, of the old books out that are not true and trying to get in alignment with hearing clearly, hearing clearly what that silent voice is saying to us. That's the, that's the panacea here. We've all got this silent voice inside that speaks to us of the truth. And I think we all can pretty, pretty much agree. We got a silent voice that is guiding us, taking care of us, leading us to lectures, to discussions, to certain movies, etc. So you can see that at the same time, the problems have gotten so bad. And the US is going through this tremendous identity crisis with the Pluto return. It's the chance now to become the kind of country that we want to become. Not because it's profitable, but because that's what we really want to do. How many places do you walk or see throughout the US and you go through and you see these interviews of people? People are just shaking their head. People are shaking their head. How did we get here? We got here because we got here. Because we didn't go there. That's how we got here. Because we came here. So I'm no magician. I am trying to show you astrologically what's happening. The, the Pluto return is going to continue. It's going to continue digging up junk. It's going to continue having presidential homes invaded by the FBI. Junk and stuff is going to come out. The pus is going to come out. The uh, aggravation is going to come out. The unfairness is going to come out. At the same time, we're going to get stronger and stronger and be able to fight it better. Just like with the Neptune, we'll get more la-la land or else we'll start to correct our spiritual arrow. So there's your story. That's what's happening in the country. We're going to get more corrupted and sicker and closer to death, or we're going to own our courage and fix what we need to fix, because Eris is going to kick the hell out of us if we don't. And on the spiritual side, we're going to go more into la-la land, not looking at what's really there, or we're going to start becoming directly honest with ourselves, work in groups, work in churches, work in whatever books to help us become more spiritually aligned. So I purposely left 13, 15 minutes over. That's basically what's going on. The Pluto is going to go on for at least three, four more years. The Eris is going to go on for at least 20 more years. The Neptune is going to go on three or four more years. So we can see this next presidential election is going to really be a big deal. And you're starting to see, you're continuing to see a totally dysfunctional Congress. Every vote is 50 50. It's just not what Jefferson meant. I don't think it's what they meant. Some people are talking about what I've talked about for years, a new constitution version 2.0. We need a 2.0 as 1.0 has been beat to death. So any questions you may have, I'd be glad to take a look at them. Or any comments you may have, just raise your hand and we'll get to them. Judy W, I can't see you. All I can see is your eyes. <laughs> Hi, Judy W. Where are you from?
unmute. Yeah. Okay. I am from north of Pittsburgh. Okay. Well, hello. Show. hello. Welcome to the show. John, yes. anybody, anybody else? Judy, comments, questions? Just raise your hand. I'll be glad to entertain it. Uh, Marsha Bud, uh, go ahead. You are unmuted. Yes, I've been thinking about all the young women in our country who won't get the medical care that they're going to need and how this is affecting them and how it's going to affect them in the next three, four years. Yeah, and, and look what they did in Kansas. And look what they did in Kansas, right. It was look amazing. what they did in Kansas. That's our only hope. And I'm sorry to tell you, guys, but you're not the answer. The women are going to have to solve the problems. At least get us started, don't you think, Marcia? Yes, yes, yes. It's just more of a maternal thing. It's a more of a maternal fix that we need rather than might is right and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, the right. patriarchy is just all encompassing. They feel like they can just, just, you know, collapse like everything what, that a woman is about. Like what, like what Russia is doing to Ukraine. <laughs> you know, same idiotic story. Well, but what, what's important here, because I'm real aware of this. Let me tell you how this happened. I wrote articles for years about Pluto. I got sick of writing articles about Pluto. And, and then there was a time about 2002, 2012 to about 2017, where I said to myself, what's going on here isn't Pluto. That's why I'm not writing anymore. Something else is happening. And that was the very time that we're, we were being conned. We were being tricked. It was Eris coming into the fore. It was Eris coming to the front of the stage. And we kept confusing it with more Pluto. And that's still what's happening. People still think that all this junk's happening because of Pluto. It's not. It's because of Pluto and Eris. It's very Erisian. So I have to venture to think that all of you have been feeling this heiress in you. This feeling of, I want to, I've had enough. You see the blacks in the streets with their signs. They could go to violence, but they don't. They've had enough. They want change. You see the women in front of the uh, Supreme Court. Here's a ridiculous name. Huh? They want change. But what's behind it all? It's a wanting it to be fair. There's nothing dramatic. It's wanting it to be fair, like all societies have yearned for, wanting it to be fair and for everybody to be included. Isn't that what you're saying? So I, yes, John, Marsha, I encourage all of you to get louder, talk more, get your voice out, be heard. Because there's a lot of people that will follow you if you just take a couple of steps. Yeah, John. Of all the planets, I think of two that I get a female sense of, Venus and Eris. All the others, I get a sense that they're very male. What's wrong well, here? Well, that's, that's a real good point. I've never thought of it completely. But I think you're correct. Venus is very feminine. Eris, she is very feminine. Um, Pluto is usually looked at as a male. Uh, Neptune, Neptune is so uh, non 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 generic. It's both. I'm Aphrodite. It's either one, whatever you want it to be. Yeah, I think you're right. I think those are very feminine planets, and I think that's a, a good point because we need to uh, see how powerful the feminine energy is of Eris. Uh, Erica says that we need to include the asteroids such as Ch Chiron and, and Vesta and Ceres. Of course we do, of course we do, but they can't hold a candle to what Neptune, Pluto and Eris are doing. But we need to include everything, use all the tools we got. And by the way, if you don't see it, 
I see it, astrology is on the rise. It's on the rise because it's real, because it works. And it's just a shame that it's really hard to do. And there are just so many opinions. It just is. So I don't have a lot of hopes for it taking over in a K through 12 class because it's just so hard to itemize and to uh, certify. It really is. Other thoughts, everybody? Other thoughts, other questions? Anybody? Uh, yes, Susan, in Washington State, Oregon. She's in Oregon. Oregon. She's in Oregon. Um, so anybody who's born 54, 55, thereabouts, would have had Chiron opposite uh, Jupiter and Uranus. No, just Uranus. I also have Jupiter right there. Well, you're different because Jupiter only stays in a sign for one year. Okay. So, so Jupiter, so, and, Jupiter moves and on. 54. Okay. But um, currently then Pluto is lining up with where Chiron was at that time. And Chiron and Jupiter approaching and Aries all in Aries are like the focal point of a T-square to that whole mess. So what does that mean to like my generation basically? Well, what it means when you're seeing so much Aries, um, and Aries certainly has its bad points, but Aries has a really good point. The, the really good, good point of Aries is it, it comes down to you. That's what Aries says. It's up to you. Okay. And a cancer country doesn't want to hear that. Cancer wants to sit there and have somebody come along and save them. And the country's not going to do that. And in an Aries country, it's not going to wait around for anybody. It's going to get up and take the leadership and start chopping the weeds and start making trails, even if it's wrong. But in this case, Aries is much better off to chop a false trail than it is to sit back and do nothing. See, what's hurting us is, is the, other can the other side of cancer in our chart. The cancer side which is so worried a bit about being attacked. It's so worried about, I got mine, you better go get yours. That kind of mentality, you just can't fly. That mentality is killing us. That's why we're dying to get Pluto on into Aquarius. When it gets into Aquarius, we're all gonna start picking up this theme more and more two years from now of let's work together as a group. Aquarius. Make sense to you? Yep. Very good work, Susan. That's a good kind of research to do. Any other questions? How about down under? Tell me what the hell's going down in Australia? I'm hearing I'm hearing all kinds of complaints about the government there. What's going on down under? Well, we call it a, um, now a mini America. We feel <laughs> that we <laughs> Say no. Say no. <laughs> <laughs> Too much influence from America. Um, that's how you, we know, feel. You, you couldn't have said it any better. And yeah. you know, we're really, really sincerely sorry. We really, <laughs> we really didn't want to spread that kind of effect in the world. No. We've got a lot of really good intentions. And you're our good friends. And we hope the hell you can learn from our lessons. Yeah, yeah, it's been difficult. I think worldwide for everyone. The yeah. only lesson out there is just get the get the money out of the hands of the rich. Yeah, we're yeah. starting. We're starting. Don't you laugh, John? John is laughing when I said <laughs> you got to get the money out of the hands of the rich, at least some of it, and spread it around. Boy, I didn't know I'd get such an exact, perfect answer, huh? I mean, a mini America. Oh, God. <laughs> Go ahead, John. The story of Robin Hood. I love it. <laughs> We're going to have to have Naomi back on here. What is it, 11.30 your time? Uh, yeah, it's 11.30 in the morning, yeah. Well, please, yeah. Join, please join us again. 
And I will. I'll be back. Definitely. Please ap it. apologize to all your Australian friends <laughs> and all the. We'll all get through uh, it together. Hopefully. And, you yeah. know, a lot of people are moving to Australia. Yeah, well, a lot of people from here are moving to Asia. <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. Well, don't come here. No, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the that's what the new sign says on the statue. Don't come yeah. here. <laughs> you know, it's very frustrating for us because we have so many wonderful people and wonderful resources. And, and you see the con job that's going on that they pull off with the networks and all. So um, keep your head up. I tried very hard tonight to show you both sides, but still be honest about what's really happening. And it really is happening. But I showed you both sides of these energies. And when you can start to own your Erysian energy and your Pluto energy, you're pretty damn tough. John. You're the astrological Walter Cronkite. <laughs> I don't think he ever cussed on the air, did he? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, John, for that nice compliment. Everybody, even though it was difficult, I enjoyed talking with you. YouTubers, thanks for joining and hanging with us. Good to see Sigmund. Good to see you Australians. Now go down there and do an about face. Don't become like us. <laughs> Bye, y'all. See you, you next week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. Bye-bye, Erica.